Also on Sunday mornings, we're in the book of Romans. We're going through this book, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And today, find ourselves in verse 12. And our text will be verses 12 through 14. So once you find your way there, if you're able, if not, that's okay. But I'll have you stand. I'll read. You can follow along. Verses 12 through 14, Romans 6. The Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit, writes, verse 12, and says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For, verse 14, sin shall not be your master. Now some of your translations will render it, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Why? Because you are not under law, but under grace. Let's pray. Ask God's blessing on our time in his word. <sighs> Lord, we're standing here before you, acknowledging our need for the Holy Spirit to teach us, to minister to us, to speak in that still small voice that we might hear, listen, have ears to hear. Lord, would you keep any distraction away that would keep us away from that which you would desire to do in our midst today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Beginning in verse 12, the beloved apostle moves from explanation to exhortation. Heretofore, he's explained what God's grace is not. And now that he's offered this explanation, he can present the exhortation knowing that these Christians in Rome should have a better understanding of the how behind the what of grace. Now, right out of the chute, we have a very powerful and even personal application. Here's what I'm thinking. We do err in our attempts at heeding the what of exhortation absent the how of the explanation. Now, bear with me. I know that sometimes I can get and make things complicated. And I think for those of you who know me, you know it's my gift. I have the gift of complication. <laughs> but bear with me. I am of the belief that the enemy does everything and stops at nothing to steal from us, even keep from us, this very crucial how. See, he knows that if he's successful in robbing us of the how, then he's got us. We're defeated when it comes to the what. See, if I'm missing the explanation of how God's grace works, or better said, doesn't work, I'll have no hope of heeding the exhortation of what grace does. Now, I have to share with you that I have been looking forward to the text that we have before us this morning ever since I sensed that we were to go into the book of Romans after completing the book of Acts. This is, and by the way, it only gets better from here. Chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8 have been so huge in my own personal understanding of how gracious God is. Make no mistake about it. 
God is gracious. I don't know what kind of sin you brought to church with you today, but God's grace is sufficient for you here today. Now the problem is, Satan doesn't want you to know that. He wants to keep it from you. He wants to keep it locked from your reach so you do not have access to it. This is the reason that I chose to title this new series, What Satan Doesn't Want Me to Know. And today's teaching will be part one of this series, which, Lord willing, should go through the entirety of the rest of the chapter. Now, you'll forgive me for what seems to be a rather provocative title, but my sense is that the Lord wants to expose the satanic lies from the father of lies, especially in the place of God's grace. I'll take it a step further. Keenly aware that I risk sounding sensational, but here's what's at stake. The truth of the matter is, if I don't know this, I will have the potential of either walking away from the Lord or faking it and being a phony in the Lord. That's what's at stake here. If I don't understand what God's grace is, what God's grace does, and how it will manifest itself in my life, one of those two things could become characteristic of my life. Let me explain this just briefly, and then we'll get into starting with verse 12. If I don't know what God wants me to know, and if I don't know what Satan doesn't want me to know, I will never live victoriously under God's grace. Instead, my Christian experience will be riddled with defeat under the law. And this could cause me to cave in to condemnation and in so doing, give up on God. Now on the other side of the table, if I don't cave in and give up, then the temptation will be to cover up. And this is because I'm not able to make the Christian life work for me. I, when I come to passages like the one before us, it, it's not real in my Christian experience. And so I dismiss it under the banner of, well, I can't make that work. That does not resemble what my Christian experience is. Here's the good news. And it's woven into the fabric of this exhortation in Romans 6. Neither giving up nor covering up is necessary under grace. Under the law, it is. You got to do something under the law, but not under grace. Now, no need. I don't need to fake it. I don't need to hide it. There's no need under grace. But this presupposes that I'm not under the law. This supposes that Sin does not reign in my life because if it is, I'll never taste from the cup of God's grace. And again, Satan doesn't want me to know this. He wants me to think that sin will always have its grip on my life. Habitual sin. Sin that you once thought would go away when you came to Christ. And how shocked were you when you realized that, oh my goodness, I still sin. Listen, as long as you're in this body, you will sin. But see, Satan doesn't want me to know that while I can't say I'll never sin again, 
I can say, I don't need to sin now. But if I do, there's grace. His grace is sufficient. Why? Because I've been set free. The story is told of a great eagle tied to a post, walking sadly round and round. Well, one day a new owner announced that he would release the bird. So a crowd gathered and the rope was removed and the eagle continued walking round and round in the same old rut. He was free to fly and yet did not. The sad absurdity of that scene is like the Christian who continues to sin. We, like this eagle, don't have to. We've been freed. But Satan wants us to continue thinking that we've not. And we continue living our lives as if we've not been freed from that sin reigning in our lives. Now, if we know that, then we'll no longer have to continue on living like that. You know, for me, the test, the acid test as to whether or not I know that I've heard truth is if I've been freed. And conversely, I know that I've not heard truth if I'm not freed, because the truth shall set you free. It's, this is a principle. You don't break it. It breaks you. See, John records how that the commands of the Lord are not burdensome. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. When someone lays a heavy trip on me, lays the law down on me, and I'm burdened by it, condemned in it, that's not truth. I know I've heard truth, the truth of grace, when I'm freed because of it. I was able to identify several of these freeing truths from what will be the remainder of Romans chapter 6. You might find more in your own personal study, but for today anyway, we're going to look at the first three. Uh, the first one found in verse 12. Satan doesn't want me to know that I don't have to obey evil desires. Now listen to verse 12 to what the Apostle Paul writes. He packs such a powerful punch by saying this, sin doesn't have to reign. Don't let sin reign. Key word, let. Don't give permission to sin to reign in your life and control your life. So that if you do, you obey its evil desires. Now, he's going to expound on this in the verses that follow, but it seems now at least that he deems it necessary to emphasize how it is that we don't have to let sin reign. In other words, if sin reigns, we have given it permission to do so. We don't have to let sin sit in our chair or on our hickey, eh? in our family room, and we don't have to give it the remote control to our lives so that when it pushes the button and goes to the evil desires channel, you know which channel I'm talking about. There's actually more than one available on Oceanic and all the satellite dishes and everything else. Now, it's paramount in its importance that we understand how it is that Satan doesn't want us to know this. Why? Because he wants us to think he's in control. Every time he snaps his fingers, we fall. Every time he pushes the buttons on that remote control, we're controlled. Why? Because we let him. My boys know when I walk in the room, and they have the remote control that they need to repent and give me the remote control. <laughs> it's just a, it's a custom in my country. But anyway. Now, if I take the remote back, which under grace I can do, and I give it to the Holy Spirit instead, I'm no longer controlled by and obedient to those evil desires because now... 
My life is under the control of the Holy Spirit. Okay. I think at this juncture, I would be grossly remiss were I not to point out something that's here in verse 12 before we move on to verse 13. Notice with me that we can actually give sin permission to control our mortal body. It's going to get a little bit more descriptive in the sense that it's our body parts, parts of our body that are offered to sin, as we'll see next. But these are the lusts or the desires of our mortal body, so we obey. And the way Paul writes about this carries with it the idea of offering body parts to the lusts or desires of sinful actions. When sin reigns, that's what happens. That's the result. That's the consequence. And when I do this, I will obey that which I'm controlled by. And that which I'm controlled by will be whatever I've given a blank check to. Then sin is allowed to assume control of my checking account, if you will, and fill in any amount. Why? Because I've given it control. I've given it access. William Newell in his commentary says, it is through the lusts or desires of the body that sin is ready to assume control. The body has many desires, not in themselves evil. Paul, speaking of foods, says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. It's when natural desires are yielded to in self-will or self-indulgence that sin uses the desires of the body to assert sin's power and establish its reign. The believer is directed to reject this reigning of sin, which would involve our obeying the desires of the body. Listen, we owe sin nothing. We owe sin nothing. We are dead to it, justified from it, and living in another sphere. It, it can't have what it used to have in terms of control in my life now, under grace. Hands off. You can't snap your fingers anymore. You can try all you want, but I don't have to respond. I don't have to obey. I don't have to give in. I don't have to cave in. This will come into clearer focus here with our second one in verse 13. Satan doesn't want me to know that I don't have to give in to fleshly passions. In verse 13, Paul gets a little more descriptive in this exhortation when he warns about the offering of our body parts. I don't know how else to say it. That's how he says it. And our offering of our body parts as instruments of wickedness. And instead, he says, don't offer them as instruments of wickedness, but as instruments of righteousness as you offer them to God. Because when they become instruments of righteousness, you will be as those who have been brought from death to life. See, so you're a new creation in Christ. Now, I don't want you to let your imagination go too crazy here. But when you think about body parts, the flesh, what comes to mind? How about the tongue? Actually, James identifies the tongue as the most wicked body part that we have. This little piece of flesh right behind the white picket fence trying to keep it in place to not let it loose to do its damage because it can become an instrument of unspeakable wickedness. Listen to what James says about it, chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. 
All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse <laughs> men. That's the JDV, the S part. Who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Here's the bottom line. We are under grace, able now to reign in that which prior had reigned over us. Those body parts no longer have to be offered as instruments of wickedness. Now, under grace, they can be offered as instruments of righteousness. It's this third one in verse 14 that I want to spend the remainder of our time on today because it is huge. Satan doesn't want me to know that I don't have to be mastered by past sin. I don't have to be dominated by sin. Sin no longer has dominion over me. And that's what he declares. It shall not be my master. And he tells us why. It's because I'm no longer under law, but am now under grace. This verse has what I call the pow and the wow. I, I don't know how else to say it. It just, it packs so much punch. I mean, actually, I could preach an entire series of sermons on just this one verse, and you know I can. <laughs> And I would be disingenuous if I didn't confess that I was and am even now still tempted to savor the flavor of Romans 6.14. Again, I know this sounds sensational, but Romans 6.14 has the power to change your life. I don't say that to, you know... I, I, I simply say that because I myself have been the recipient of that. And it came really vis-a-vis -vis my misunderstanding of what it meant. See, when you read 614, you, you think, okay, well, sin no longer has dominion over me. Well, wait a minute. Mm, sin does, you know, still kind of have dominion over me. So this doesn't work for me. I can't make this work for me. Maybe you'll indulge me for just a bit. I want to share with you how God has used the pow and the wow of this verse to transform my mindset about what it means to be under grace. I'm going to ask you, though, to do something. You need to put aside your preconceived notions about what it means to no longer be mastered by sin. What it means to no longer have sin, have dominion over you. If you're anything like me, you too may have bought into the notion that not being mastered by sin meant you would no longer be tempted to sin. I would submit to you, this is not the temptation to sin, this is the condemnation of sin. Now, please, never make synonymous the temptation to sin with sin. If that were true, then Jesus wasn't sinless because Jesus was tempted. Jesus did not sin, but just because you're tempted to sin doesn't mean that you will sin. James addresses this in great detail about sin enticing us. And it's when we do it, we give in to it, it drags us away. And we have sinned. 
but it's not a sin to be tempted to sin. Now, why do I say that? Because if I think that this has to do with the temptation to sin, shoot me now. If it's the temptation to sin that shall no longer have dominion over me, put me out of my misery. Because the temptation to sin is ever about me. It's all over me. It's always in front of me. And it always will be until the trumpet sounds. And we get our new bodies. Which, by the way, I can't wait. This, this body is, man, a lot of miles on the bugger. You know, and I can't wait for my new one. But as long as I have this mortal body and the body parts with it, I will always be subject to the temptation to sin. So Romans 6.14 shouldn't be in my Bible if that's the case. Well, it's not the case, because that's not God's grace. Well, what does it mean then? If it's not the temptation to sin that has dominion over me under grace, then what is it? It's not temptation, it's condemnation. Now, please stay with me because, again, this is so huge. The potential for this one verse to set you free from the condemnation of the devil is unspeakable. It can change the whole complexion of your Christian life. Here's an example. You sin. Last week, you know who you are. Heads bowed, eyes closed, eyes closed. You blew it bad. Wednesday. That's not a word of knowledge or anything. I'm just by way of illustration. Was not the devil right there? Are you going to ask for forgiveness again? Man, I'd, if I were you, I'd lay low. I'd lay really low right now because how many times did you tell God you wouldn't do that? Oh, man, he's... he's He's really ticked. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother praying right now. And by the way, if you were planning on going to the Thursday night midweek study, which by the way, 7 o'clock right here, book of Deuteronomy, shameless plug, there you go. Great study, almost in the book of Joshua. I can't wait. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to church if I were you because, man, if they knew what, if pastor knew what you did, can, can I just put your mind at ease? I don't want to. If they only, it, and you call yourself a Christian, boy, you better make sure nobody finds out. That's condemnation. Why? See, condemnation will distance me from God, but conviction will draw me to God. It's the condemnation that shall no longer have dominion over you under grace. There is therefore now, Romans 8, 1, can't wait to get to 8. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation. If you're here this morning and you think God is mad at you, has had it with you, He's probably through with you. You have believed the lie of the enemy. Nothing could be further from the truth. God loves you. God has grace for you. God forgives you. Roy Hessian, author of The Calvary Road, a book that I do not recommend for the faint at heart. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Well, in his book, Forgotten Factors, he says this in such a grand and glorious way. Here's what he writes. If we are to experience sin not having dominion over us, we shall have to know truly what it is to be living under grace and not under law. But first of all, we must understand what sin not having dominion over us really means. Part of our trouble stems from having a wrong conception of what this is. 
I used to think it was promised that I could get to a place where I would have no more problems with sin, that I would be dead to its solicitations, temptations. But I never could assert that I had got to that place and I came to hate this text, Romans 6.14. I hated it because it did not seem to work in my experience. I have come to see that the dominion of sin is not firstly its ability to fascinate me, to entice me, to yield, and through constant repetition on my part to form itself into a habit, but rather that its dominion consists in the guilt which it will always leave behind as its legacy. Its hangover of guilt is still there in the heart, either consciously or subconsciously. The sin is one thing, but the superstructure of guilt and condemnation that the devil builds upon it is another and is sometimes far greater than the original sin upon which it was built. To understand then, the true nature of the dominion of sin and what are the devil's intentions in it is the first step into freedom. We are now ready to hear the message of grace. The grace of God is the love of God in action toward those who deserve nothing and can do nothing. <laughs> the law has certainly reduced us to that place and doing so has actually made us candidates for grace. Under grace, a new motivation comes to the liberated soul, the motivation of love. He that is forgiven much loves much. Under law, there was just no other motivation than fear, the fear of sin and the fear of guilt and the fear of condemnation, and nothing we could do could remove it. But under grace, under the shadow of the cross of Jesus, the guilt is gone. The accusations of Satan are silenced. The conscience is made whiter than snow. And a mighty new motivation comes into our hearts. The motivation of love for the one who has done all this for us. This motivation leads us to quit the sin. By the way, this is going to come up again. Verse 15. He's going to ask the same question rhetorically that he asked in chapter 5, verse 20. Does this mean... That if sin no longer has dominion over me, I can just keep on sinning? God forbid. It doesn't work that way. Now my motivation out of love, because I've tasted from the cup of his grace, is that I don't want anything to do with that sin. I'm going to quit the sin. And he goes on to say, present myself and my body as a slave to the one who has done this for me. Indeed, that is precisely how Romans 6 sums it up. So it is that under grace, there is no need to despair because of sin, when in some form, it is again part of our experience. The blood of Jesus is ever available for our restoration and cleansing. In this new situation, sin still need not have dominion over me for any longer than it takes to get to the cross and confess it. No need to feel that I only can cover it up. No need to feel that I need to be a hypocrite. Under grace, we can afford to be honest, call sin, sin, without any excuse. Let's go back to Wednesday. You know, remember what you did? You know how much condemnation you should actually come under and for how long you should come under it and have that be uh, in dominion over you? As long as it takes you to get from point A to point B. What's point A? The sin. What's point B? The cross. The sooner you get there, the better. Don't let the enemy keep you from the cross. Because if he does, he's got you. He'll dismantle you part by part, piece by piece. Your faith, your, your trust in the Lord, your understanding of the love of God, the grace of God. He's going to just destroy it, dismantle it. 
and discard it. Let me close this way. I've thought long and hard about this, and even the <laughs> preparation process to for a teaching like this, well, let's just say it was interesting this last week, especially on Wednesday. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> I was talking about you and not myself, of course. I'm the pastor. I'm you know, close to sinless as you're going to get. But just anguishing through the whole week and in anticipation of this teaching, this text, this particular text. You know, there's a, a wrestling of sorts that took place. I'm back and forth with God. Well, okay, all right. But, but, I, I, I felt like what they call the Christian motorboat. But, 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 you know. And <laughs> I found myself just, you know, exposed. God. It all comes down to grace. It all comes down to grace. God is a gracious God. If I don't see God as being a gracious God, I won't want anything to do with him. I'll keep my distance from him, and not only him, but his people. I wonder if maybe one of the reasons why, and I'm speaking to the men here, chiefly. I wonder if this might explain why it is that men aren't involved in serving God in the ministry. Not necessarily in the pastorate, but they're not serving God. They're not in the ministry because they're laying low living under the condemnation that has now had dominion over them. You know, the best way to break that is to get it out in the open. Get it out into the light. You know, one thing about moving to Hawaii that was uh, very interesting to me is the um, size of the cockroaches uh, here. So we don't have cockroaches where I come from. These buggers are huge. I'm convinced some of these cockroaches are demon-possessed. I mean, they really are. I, I just think, God, what do you... I, there cannot be cockroaches in heaven. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. I may be wrong, but... Anyway, you know that cockroaches love the dark. So on the side of our house, when I'll move a, a pot, you know, one of these flower pots that's been sitting there for a while, and I, you know, expose it to the light, all these cockroaches just, phew, gone. No longer having dominion <laughs> under that. That's the way it is with condemnation. I want to encourage you as we close today, to just in the quietness of your own heart, the Lord sees your heart. Maybe there's something today that you just want to say, okay, Lord, I, I get it. <laughs> I got it. Uncle, I got it. I surrender. And leave it here. For some of you, you, you need to come to the cross. For some, you need to come back to the cross. You've been away too long. Can I say it this way? He longs for you to come back. Like the prodigal, he's waiting. Arms stretched wide. Come on. I love you so much. I'm not mad at you. I have only grace for you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to clean you because of my love for you. That's what awaits you. Won't you do it? Won't you stand? Father, how is it possible that we could ever thank you enough 
I suppose our only consolation is that we'll have all of eternity to worship you, to thank you, to praise you. But Lord, for now, we just need to confess to you that there's much about your grace that we don't understand. And it's really been the reason why we've been unable to embrace your grace. Lord, would you free us so that we can get out from underneath the dominion of sin's condemnation? That it can be replaced by that grace? Lord, for anyone here in this church this morning that just needs to come to you, come back to you, confess to you, receive from you this grace, Lord, would you just enable them to do this by the power of the Holy Spirit? Lord, we, we want to give you permission today to do this. We want this to be real in our lives. We don't want there to be a disparity between what we've just seen here and what we see and know is true in our lives. We want to live victoriously, not defeated and condemned, but under grace, free. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name.